Here is an old German owl pigeon, a pigeon we think is quite lovely. And on this video, we're going to be talking to you about the history of old German owls and walking you through the standard and then showing you some real ones. And by the time you're done, you'll know everything you ever wanted to know about old German owls. As you can see from this lithograph from about 1750, owl type birds have been around for a long time. This one shows a lot of the owl features we'd recognize today. It has the rounded head, a short beak, nice frill. It has the short legs with no feathers on the bottom and a rounded breast, slightly thickened neck. And this one happens to be shield marked. Of course, this was only one of many variations that came later because every country in Europe and the Middle East, it seems, made a version of the owl. So there are ones in Scandinavia. There are owls in Germany. There are owls in the Middle East. But this was one that was around at the time. Another, an interesting variation is shown on this little postcard we have from 1909. This is an English postcard. And as you can see, this bird has a lot of the same features as the other one, although it looks from the picture like this bird has a slightly shorter beak. But it has the rounded head and the frill, and it's shield marked. It's also tail marked. This is also called Anatolian marked. So here was a variation of an owl that was put on a postcard in England in 1909, and so must have been common and probably popular. Another picture we have from about the 1920s or 1930s shows the German tail-marked owl. And this owl, if you look at it, looks very much like the ones we have in the United States now. They were brought here very soon after this picture, so you can see that they stayed pretty much the same. They have the slightly more pointed face and narrower beak, um, the smaller shell crest, but really, these look very much like the ones we have today. This is a nice picture because it shows four colors, or actually three. Um, it shows the blue, which is in spread and in the, and the, with a tail bar. And then it shows the recessive red, both in the red and in the dilute yellow form. So this is a real nice picture showing the variation in color on the tail owls. Um, next to that, we have a picture that looks more like the old German owl today. This only shows shield-marked ones. This is a German picture from about 25 years ago. And you can see that this is pretty much what they look like now. They have the rounded head, the shell crest with rosette, the short legs without feathering, the thick neck, and the round breast. And these all have very nice shield marks since it's a drawing. Um, the colors here are nice too. On the left is the spread blue, which is black. On the right next to that in the back is the um, tea pattern red, which shows red. And next to that is the tea pattern red dilute, which is yellow. Then we have a nice blue bar. Below that, a blue check, and then next to that is a red bar. And this looks very much like how these owls look today. But if you compare this to the picture we saw of the tail owls, you can see that the two divergent strains here, this one that stayed in Germany longer, developed the rounder head, and the tail owls that came before stayed pretty much as they were when they came here with a slightly narrower head. Before we look at some real birds, it might be helpful to go through the standard with this drawing, which is a pretty nice one. It's from the Dutch standard, and it's a real useful one for pointing out the points of an owl. The first thing to know about them is that they're supposed to be a medium size and compact bird, so they're not really large. They also should have a distinct owl character, which generally means that they're a pretty calm and friendly bird. Um, to start with the head, if you look at the head, the head should be nearly round, and you can see that this bird has a really nicely rounded forehead. That's important. That's what they're supposed to do. They should also have, in the shell-crested variety, a nice complete shell crest with rosettes. You can also see that this crest is set high enough on the head so that the top of the crest is higher than the top of the head. That's important. It's a common flaw for the crest to be too far back and therefore look too flat. The beak should meet the head at an obtuse angle, as this does, so there should be a break in the slope between the forehead and the beak, but the beak should still be slanted downward. It should not be horizontal. The beak is also supposed to be fairly broad, about as broad as it is long, actually, and it should be flesh-colored with a very small wattle. The eye is a bull eye, and the sear should be very small and as nearly white as possible. The bird should have a broad neck, as this one does, and it should have a nice, well-developed frill. Another common fault is for there not to be a frill. The chest should be round, and this bird is actually in the perfect stance, so that you can see the broadness of the neck enhanced by the frill, and then the nice, round breast. Um, the back, the, actually, it's harder to see the shape here, but you can. They should be broader here across the shoulders and then taper down tightly to a compact tail with the wings lying nice and flat on the tail, as these do. So this is how the bird should stand, and it should taper down toward the tail. The legs are short, 
as these are, and they're feathered just down about this far. There's no feathers on the toes or the lower part of the leg. The feathering should be well developed and should lie tightly to the body. The shield marking should be fairly distinct as this is with colored thumbs and nice even here. The ideal is 10 white flight feathers. The colors should be saturated and as strong as possible. Here's a bird that shows the typical owl-shaped head. It's a nearly round head with a well-arched forehead, as you can see here, going up above his eye and behind his beak. The beak should actually break and slope from the forehead and should be angled. It should be an obtuse angle, but the beak shouldn't be horizontal. But it also should not just follow the curve of the head. And you can see on his that it doesn't. There's a slight break in the angle. Um, he has bull eyes. The beak should be flesh-colored. Um, and he should have a shell crest, which you can kind of see here as he looks at you there. And the crest should be closed with rosettes on each side. Let me see if I can get him to turn his head. He's going to be cranky. Let me turn him around. There's the rosette, if you can see it. Full, nice full rosettes are good. It's actually pretty hard to get rosettes on both sides sometimes. shape that isn't quite right. This little bird does have a rounded head, as you can see, but her face is just a little pointy at the front. Um, she's not well rounded enough. If also, if you look, she doesn't have very much break and slope between the beak and the forehead. Um, the other problem with this little bird is that her crest is too far back. It's a nice little crest and it has rosettes, but if you can see, it starts back behind where her head starts sloping down. And so when you look at her from the front, it looks very flat against her head. So this bird does not have the best head. But otherwise, she's fine. She has nice small eyes there. She has bull eyes. OK, here's a bird that has what we call a shovel crest. His, if you look at him, you can see his crest is a little too far back. But it also just kind of looks sort of like a shovel blade sticking up behind his head. And it has no rosettes at all. It just ends. Um, you might be able to see it better if you look this way. It just kind of ends on the sides of his head. His head is also slightly flattened on the top, and you want it to be round. Um, the other thing about this bird to notice is that his eye sears are a little coarse. They have a slight pinkish tinge, and they're a little thicker than is desirable. But this bird is about five years old. He's a cock. And as they get older, those tend to coarsen and redden, especially in the male birds. So that's common. Here's a little bird who's actually quite pretty, but shows one of the faults that's pretty hard to get around, and that is the top part of her beak is black. Um, this is not acceptable. Um, however, otherwise, she's pretty nice. She has a little crest with rosettes. It's slightly far back. As you can see, it's back behind the curve of her head, if she would let me look that way. <laughs> but um, here, let's see. Can you see it that way? See, it's back. It's a little too low. She also has one of the faults that you don't see very often, which is, if you can see, she has a black feather in her neck right here. And she's also developing a little black feather on one of her cheeks. Um, and this, this is also an older bird. She's a little hen about six years old. But as often happens with these birds, you can have a very pretty bird with some really kind of funny faults. And this one's little black beak is one. Here's one of our tail mark birds to show you the difference between the head, right now anyway, on the shield mark and the tail mark varieties. If you look at this little bird, you can see that she is slightly pointed in the head. In fact, as she looks at you, you can see that her beak is kind of narrow as well. And her crest is um, smaller, and the rosettes are not very clearly defined. This is an interesting thing, because although these birds were originally the same um, from Germany, a tail-marked variety and a shield-marked variety, the tail-marked ones have actually been in the United States for about 50 years and were bred separately from the German ones. And so these ones, the breeders got the, got the head a little pointy and a little less round, and the German ones went for a rounder head and a broader beak and a little less pointy head. We're working right now on getting those to come back together and working on getting the rounder head. However, as you can see, this is also a very pretty bird. She has a nice frill. Um, and she's quite pretty. OK, 
Okay, let's talk about the shield marking now. This is a shield marked bird. And the standard says that a shield marked bird should have um, ideally 10 white flights on each side. This bird, um, as you can see, if you look at his wing, actually has 11. Um, but he has colored thumbs, which they're supposed to have. Uh, the important thing actually is to think about how the shield looks and is symmetrical. So if, if the bird doesn't have 10 and 10, having an even number or not more than one off on either side is the best. You also don't want to have too many or too few white flights because the shield will start getting a funny shape when it's closed. The white thumbs are important because you want the leading edge of the wing to be colored. That emphasizes the shield. And of course, ideally, you want the shield, and now I've ruffled his feathers a little, but you want the shield to look symmetrical when the wings are closed as well. So this bird is pretty good, even though he's not the ideal. He's not 10 and 10, but he is 11 and 11. He has nice, um, clear color, which is one of the other things that the standard calls for. An interesting thing about this bird, however, he's a cock, and he's both red and black, so he does have some variation in feather color, as you can see, as this kind of funny one right here. Um, yes, but he does show both red and black in that shield. All right, here's a bird who's undermarked. This little bird actually has very nice bars and nice clear color, but if you look, on this wing he has 13 white flight feathers. He also has these white feathers that go way down across his shoulder into his shield on this side. And on this side, he does not have colored thumbs. And you can see the effect of that when you look at him. Oops, don't still fit him. When you look at him from the front, you notice right away on the leading edge of his wing it's white, and that really does kind of detract from his pretty shield. Now, the good thing about this bird, however, is that in spite of that, he does have a quite a nice head and a, the cobby, thick kind of neck he's supposed to have, and also his beak angle is really quite good. Here's a little bird who is very overmarked. In fact, since she looked at you there, um, one of the ways she's overmarked is she has a black spot on her face and a black beak. Um, although she's a pretty cute bird. But the main thing to notice about her, since we're talking about shields, is how overmarked she is in the shield. Here she has four white flights on this side, and I think she has five on the other. So she's not even, but she's also very, very overmarked. She ends up looking symmetrical, as you can see, but the shield should not extend back into the flights like this. And if you notice, um, even underneath, she's matchingly marked underneath. So actually, she's really actually quite a pretty bird, but she almost looks like some other kind of bird. Um, so you see how far the markings go back. She does have colored thumbs, however. One of the good things about being overmarked is that the thumbs are usually colored. Here's a bird that has really quite a nice full neck. Um, they should have a pretty full neck and a nice round breast. Of course, he's a little bit cranky about being held, but his breast is nice and round. He also has the proper shape, which is he should be fairly broad across the shoulders and taper down nicely into a real tightly held tail. And he does have the proper shape. Um, they shouldn't be too broad or too thin, but they should be shaped kind of like a little triangle like this. Um, finally, you notice on him, he has a pretty good frill that does help emphasize the roundness of his breast and the thickness of his neck. He's a little slenderer in shape than the last one, he, but his neck is still nice and thick and he has a good round breast. He also has the right shape again, which is the, the wide across the shoulders, tapering down. Also, if you notice this bird, he's uneven in his shield, and you can certainly see right here. Um, the one long black feather on one side is kind of funky and makes him look lopsided. The fault with this bird, which is a common one, by the way, in the shield marked ones, is he has absolutely no frill. You can see that he has a Here's a tail marked bird, so you can see what the tail marking should be like. Obviously, these birds are white all over, except for the tail. The tail marking should form as, as straight a line as possible. Here's the line across his back, and it should also form a straight line underneath, as straight as possible, which it kind of does when he doesn't fan it out. This one's pretty good. You also like the line to be real distinct. Um, this goes in a little bit here, but it's a nice black color. One interesting thing about the tail marked birds is that although their heads are kind of pointy and we're trying to work on that, they tend to have much better frills than the shield marked ones. And there's a pretty frill. Here's a little plain headed hen. 
and I'm going to use her to illustrate not quite as good a tail marking. Um, she's also got a black tail, and if you look at it from the top, she does have a pretty straight line of demarcation. However, her feather coloring here isn't completely black. They're pretty feathers, but they're not supposed to be like that. The other thing about her is that on the bottom, she's really quite white, and there's no line of demarcation there really at all. You can tell her tail is black, kind of, um, but that's about it. She also has a nice frill, like the other tail-marked bird did, and you can see that there. Um, these plain-headed birds actually are no longer recognized in Germany, but they have not been removed from recognition here because they've been here for such a long time and quite a few people have breed them. Here are some birds showing you kind of generally their behavior. You can see these are two cocks. Um, they have the, the full chest the broad neck, um, here comes one out, um, see the legs are fairly short, not feathered on the lower part, that's important. Also this bird actually is quite good, the black one, he does not have vent marking, which is really quite common in these birds. Unfortunately he's also undermarked, but not having vent marking is, is hard to achieve sometimes. But anyway, there he is, showing his good shape, um, the rounded look to the bird, and the shortness of the leg. We'll start with the blue variations. This is a blue bar. She's got nice gray background color, the blue-gray, and with nice bars, which she's not letting me display very well. So here's one variation of blue, blue bar. Okay, there's another variation of blue. This is blue spread, which comes out to be black. This bird could either be barred or checked underneath this. We don't know which because the spread covers it. We don't have any checked birds or we show you one, but this is blue spread or black. This is a dilute blue spread, as you can see. She's a lighter colored. Um, the dilute also comes in checked or barred, but we don't have any of those, so we're showing you the spread version, which is quite pretty. This bird is red. He's a spread ash red. Um, obviously red, there could be red check or red bar, which we don't have, but this is a version of spread ash red. This is a cock bird, so he shows a little black in his feathers as well. This actually has quite a few variations in the German owls, and I'll show you a couple of others. This is another variation of spread ash red. This is a little hen, so she's not going to show any black. Um, this lacing, however, should be nice and even as possible, and you can see the red lacing kind of fades out right there. But she's actually a very pretty version of spread ash red, although unfortunately this little bird has quite a bit of white on one side, so her markings aren't good, but her color is quite nice. Finally, this is a spread ash red dilute which is called cream. This is a little hen, and you can see it's a nice color. also has a little bit of red look in it. This should also be as um, smooth as possible, so she has one kind of dark feather. But it's quite a pretty color, um, although it's harder to see the shield in this color because it's so pale. And here's a very pretty and distinctive red color. This bird is also red, and she's tea pattern. Tea pattern makes the red be very dark like this across the wing. Ideally, these should all be very red too, but this is a pretty nice bird. She has very clear color. We don't have the dilute of this color, but if we did, it would be called yellow. It would look different than the cream, and it would be called yellow. Another way to get to yellow is recessive red, um, but we don't think there is any recessive red in the shield mark birds in the States, although there, it is present in the tail mark birds, and we'll show you one of those later. But this is Here's a tail mark bird showing recessive red. We know he's recessive red because his tail wouldn't be red if it wasn't. It would be silver. So there's the nice red of the recessive red, which you can see is similar to the red in the tea pattern bird, shield mark bird. It's a nice deep brick red. And here's a nice bird showing the yellow tail from recessive red. So this is a recessive red dilute, and it actually makes a very pretty color. Her feathers are slightly washed out there, but it's a very nice yellow. Thanks for watching, and we'll let the birds take a bow.
talk about injecting your birds for uh, PMV now or any time type of a medication that you do need to inject into your birds. This is kind of a basic uh, overview of how you would uh, vaccinate your birds. Um, if you're going to use an automatic syringe, uh, make sure that you uh, look over the uh, operating instructions. It'll tell you how to assemble the uh, syringe. I'm going to real quickly go over how you clean the automatic syringe prior to um, injection. And what you have here is we have the uh, syringe, it's all assembled here. And we have a container which uh, held the old vaccine. We put a little bit of alcohol inside the container, like so. Not too much. Put the rubber stopper back on top. We all know what we're talking about if you have one of these. You uh, poke that in there. You'll see that uh, from the operating instructions, it'll show how to symbol that. We got now alcohol inside of the uh, glass container, which normally holds the vaccination. Pull the cap off here. Careful not to stick yourself, and you simply inject the alcohol through the syringe. We've got a little bit of a, a tighten up the end here. Now we've got alcohol coming right through the needle here, nice and clean. Loosen it a little bit, and we've got alcohol running out of the tip. So we just keep doing that until we've got nice, clear alcohol coming through there. All right, that looks pretty clean. Always recap your. Uh, syringe when you're done using it. Make sure you don't stick yourself. Whoops. There we go. Recap. Take your uh, alcohol off of there. Pull the cap off of it. And we're just going to shoot out any remaining alcohol. There we go. Get tighten that back up. Alrighty. We've got all the alcohol out of there. Everything's nice and clean. And now we're ready to put our new vaccine on. Alrighty, now if you do not have an automatic syringe, you can use a regular uh, uh, syringe that can be purchased for uh, diabetics or whatever. These can be gotten from most uh, pigeon 
um, supply houses or even your veterinarian or maybe even your doctor or pharmacist, or pharmacist would be able to get you one of these. The only recommendation that I have for you on these is make sure that your measurements are the same as the uh, prescribed measurement on the uh, bottle of uh, serum and also make sure that uh, you only do one dose at a time. You don't want to fill this syringe all the way up and try to do two or three injections from one full syringe and the reason why is because you run the risk of ODing, overdosing your birds if you push too far. Here's a little trick that we've come up with. Uh, you take two needles, you take your first needle and you pop it right into your uh, liquid here and then you take the plunger out. So what you have is you have the needle poking out of your liquid. And then you can take your, plun your little plunger here and you draw out the amount that you need, like so. Take that off, take another one, put it on here, and draw out the amount that you need again. However many of these you have, you can do these each as one dose. When you're finished with that, you set this down, get yourself another needle, put it on your plunger there, and you're ready to inject your birds. One needle, one plunger, keep your empty ones here, and always recap your needle when you're finished. There you go. Now we're ready to actually uh, set our uh, automatic uh, injection gun up with the uh, vaccine. And a uh, little advice here is, again, keep your little manual out, keep the manual out, make sure that you're comfortable with what you're doing. Um, the way that uh, we put the serum or vaccine in is you have to peel the top off the vaccine. That's done just like so, right there. And it's off. There we go. It's a rubber cap here. If you uh, are so inclined, make sure you put a little alcohol on that rubber cap. That way it's nice and clean. The way you uh, attach it to the gun, you just take it, push down right there, and use a little black plastic piece. Again, you've got to have your uh, manual out there so you're real comfortable with all of this. Flip your gun over and if you can get a close look in here, right here is our dosage. And we actually have it set for the proper dose but um, we're going to actually draw it back a little bit and we're going to inject some of the vaccine out. And the reason we're doing this is because we're going to clear out any alcohol that may be remaining in the line here. So uh, let's go ahead and do that now. back. See how when I turn the screw, actually, we'll make it so there's more vaccines going to be shooting through there. Okay. Pull my cap off very carefully. If you read the instructions on the vaccine, it says never to inject this into yourself. Because if you do, you need to go to a hospital ASAP. So I'm going to inject the uh, Vaccine. There we go. Keep going through there. There we go. Get it primed up. You can see we got alcohol coming through, and now we've got pure vaccine. Now that I do it, I'll do one more. This vaccine is very oily. You got to be super careful because uh, things get slippery, and you don't want to accidentally drop the gun and break the vial. Automatic injection syringe set up. We've got our medication on here, our vaccine. Um, we've got our dose set correctly here. And we're actually at this point ready to start injecting birds. Before you head out to your loft, Make sure that you have some uh, alcohol and some 
two by two wipes here because you're going to need to wet the feathers down with the alcohol. That'll let you see the skin more clearly. You'll uh, be able to work a little bit better if you have a clear view of the bird's skin. And at this point, that's when your hands start shaking and you get a little bit nervous. But just work your way through it. Once you've done it a couple of times, you'll be very comfortable with it. Uh, you have to have somebody helping you at this point. You have to have somebody who's willing to hold the birds for you. If you have kids, that's great. If you have a friend, that's great. And if you have a neighbor who's uh, willing to help you out, that would work as well. Um, one of the things I want to talk about is when you inject the birds, it's important that you don't inject into the muscle of the bird and you don't inject into the skin of the bird. So you've got a layer of skin with the feathers coming out of the skin. And underneath of that you have a pocket. That's the loose part. You're able to slide the skin around. And underneath of that you actually have the muscle. You take your arm and you pinch it you're pinching the skin, and you can feel the muscle underneath of that. And if you rub your fingers together like that, that's the area where you need to inject into. You don't want to inject into the skin. You don't want to inject into the muscle. You want to inject into that area right there. And that's where we're going to inject into the birds. It's going to be behind the neck. We're going to show you as close as we possibly can. And I'm going to have Helen bring a bird over here now so we can... Uh, Alrighty, well here comes Helen now with a bird. It's a nice looking bird too. Yes, this is, this is Jim. Jim. Um, when you're holding the bird, although Keith is going to do the complicated part, the holding is important. When you hold the bird to be injected, I hold the bird like this, with its feet back here, pretty, pretty firmly in my hand, and you can see he's not trying to get away. And with my other hand, what I'm going to do is hold him and push his head down just a little bit and expose his neck. I don't want to push his head down real hard because that will make his neck skin tight and Keith won't be able to pick it up. But this is, this is the position that you hold the bird in for his injection. Okay. When I inject the bird, one of the things that I'm going to be thinking about is I want the needle to actually run in a direction slightly downward towards the back of the pigeon. So if you kind of aim for the tip of the tail, if the bird is in a position like that, that's about the right angle that you want to go in. So again, think about your skin. Think about pinching your skin up here, and I would be injecting right underneath the skin, not straight down into the muscle, not right at the surface of the skin, in the pocket in between. Okay, so we use a little bit of alcohol here, and uh, at this point your hands are probably a little bit oily from the, uh, the uh, solution that we're using here, the uh, vaccine, so uh, you might want to put a little alcohol on your hands and you know, rub it around, get rid of some of that oil there. Let your hands dry a bit, and we'll wet the feathers down. One of the things you'll notice when you use the alcohol on the feathers is right away it kind of gets rid of that uh, fluffy, feathery look, and you can see right down into the skin. So, I've got my Monoject syringe here, or my uh, vaccine syringe here. And uh, at this point, if you want to have a good assistant, make sure you don't stab them, because it's the best way to lose one of your uh, helpers. So we pull the end off, and I'm actually going to shoot a little bit more of that solution out. Pinch the bird behind the neck. Get a nice little grab of the skin there. That one's going to pull the feathers back. Pop the needle underneath. And there we go. automatic injection syringe. We're going to show you how to do an injection using the regular little hypodermic uh, needle. I'm going to have Helen bring another bird over. Another nice looking little bird. Yes. Yellow bar. What's her name? Primrose. Cute. Okay. So again, Helen's holding the bird as you see. Mm -hmm. She's going to pull those feathers back. We're going to wet the feathers down a little bit there. Notice all the feathers are sort of clumping together. And I've got my loaded syringe here. Only one injection in there, so I don't have to worry about overdosing my bird. And then a little pinch. 
holding on to the syringe like so. I have your hold on. Too much feathers. Let's try it. There you go. Wiping yeah. it off here. Let me get yeah. a good clear look at it. Oh, she get tired of that. Yeah, it's a lot better. Okay. There we go. And perfect. As you can see, you're able to use the uh, little uh, syringe. Alrighty, well we have another bird ready and I'm going to have Helen bring this bird over. And we're using, again, our automatic injectable syringe here. And uh, this is a nice looking bird too. This is a hand named Marigold. One of the things you should notice when we're doing this is we're real calm. Mm -hmm. The first few times we did this we weren't very calm. But you can always stop. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Start yeah. again. If this you can't find the spot, right. just... Yeah. This isn't a, a, a race. You yeah, know, that's right. It, it, you know, although there are times when you want to go fast because you want to get it over with as quickly as possible. Now, I've got a little tip for everyone. If uh, your birds are molting and they've got a lot of pin feathers, that can be good in one way and another way. I think that it can make it more difficult. And that is that on the sides of the bird's neck, they have a lot of blood vessels, so if you see purpley red skin, don't want to inject into that skin because they will bleed when you inject to that. You'll, you'll know the area that you're supposed to inject into because it'll be nice pink skin. So here we go again. Take a little pinch, put our syringe in there, and there we go. Simple as pie and my hands are hardly even shaking. Here we are out at the loft and we're ready to uh, inject our birds here for paramoxivirus. I think that's how you say it, I'm not sure, PMV. And we've got our uh, syringe gun ready. We've got our alcohol ready with the uh, alcohol swipes and I have a wonderful assistant here to help me out. And we'll just head on into the loft and we'll meet you there. Okay, and we're gonna catch our birds. feathers. There, the there's the skin. Notice the <laughs> green alcohol makes it easier to see the skin. See how clear the skin is? Notice the angle of the needle sliding right between the skin and the muscle. And there you go. That's it. So easy. I want to show you something now that you got the camera up here close. Remember earlier when I was talking about the purple skin? Look on the side of this bird's neck. See how purple that skin is? Mm -hmm. That's just engorged with blood. Purple here, purple here. You don't see that too often, but what you got to do is shoot right in between there. If you don't, you'll bleed. And if he bleeds, no big deal. You'll just have to deal with that later. Just There we go. So simple. There you go. Did you see the purple? Uh, yeah, can I pull it? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Down. That's great. It's just perfect way to do it. Pinch the skin. Angle it down a little bit. Right between the two. There we go. Uh, warming your birds and uh, what we recommend is that you use a product uh, that's developed for 
the worming of horses or equine worming medication. The reason why we recommend this is that the uh, dewormer for horses is water soluble, so it's easy to use and it's easy to figure out how much the dosage would be per bird. Um, the product that we're going to be using today is called Ivermectin, and there's another product that's out there called Equimectrin, and uh, this particular brand is called Zimectrin. Okay? All of them contain Ivermectin in uh, different quantities, and we'll teach you how to figure out how to uh, uh, know which dose uh, would be appropriate for your birds. Um, these products can be uh, purchased at your local feed store or any uh, area. Now we're going to teach you how to convert the uh, medication that you have for horses into the uh, medical dose for pigeons. So what we're going to do is we're going to exchange horse flesh for pigeon. So pounds per pigeon, pounds per horse, to pounds per pigeon. There we go. Uh, pretty complicated, so if you uh, want to take notes, now would be the time to do it. And uh, fortunately, I have a really smart friend. Her name's Helen Bressler, and she's going to help me out uh, with this one because it is complicated. Um, you can do it on paper, and uh, she's going to show us how to do it. Come on over, Helen. Okay, here's how you start. The first thing you need to know is what's the proper dose of ivermectin per pigeon. We found that out by going to a medical formulary site on the web, and that said that the proper dose per pigeon is 500 micrograms of ivermectin. We assumed that was for an average size pigeon, and since the old German owl is a little smaller, we decided to use 400 micrograms. So, the next thing you need to know once you know the dose per pigeon is you need to know how many micrograms do you have. Our little tube here is not calibrated in micrograms. It's calibrated in pounds of horse. So what we had to do to make our calculation, we had to figure out, and it says on the box, that the proper dose per horse is 91 micrograms per pound. Our tube will dose a 1,250 pound horse. So to find the total micrograms we have, we multiplied 1,250 by 91, and we came up with 113,000 micrograms of ivermectin in our tube. Then we took the dosage per pigeon, which is 400 micrograms for an old German owl, and we divided 113,000 by 400 micrograms, and we came up with 284 pigeons. So we have a dose here for 284 pigeons total. Then you get to use these little snaps on the side to help you um, because what we did is we divided, there are 25 snaps on the side, so we divided our 284 pigeons by 25 and we know that each one of these little snaps will dose about 11 pigeons. Wonderful. Okay, so we know that each snap is going to treat 11 pigeons. Mm -hmm. Well, we also know that ivermectin is pretty flexible. You can't really overdose your birds or underdose your birds, say, per se. So uh, we don't have to worry really too much as long as we're close. Mm -hmm. So we could probably safely bet that it's about 10 birds per snap, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Okay, well that makes it a lot easier. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go from there and uh, next we'll show uh, people how to mix. Okay, now we figured out that it's about uh, 10 birds per snap on your uh, paste tube here. So I want to show you how to set the set the paste tube up so you're ready to dose 10 birds. And I think it's best to do 10 birds at a time. Um, if you have a large loft, you can mix it however many birds at a time you want. But you take your little snap guide here and you set it, I'm just going to do to 10 birds. So I reset the guide up one snap, you see the space right here. That's for 10 birds. Now what you want to do is you want to get a container something that you can uh, shake up and it you know, doesn't hold too much liquid, works perfectly. And you take your cap off here and you inject your paste right onto the top of your cap. So, anyhow, I'm going to go ahead and just put paste on here. And we've got enough paste there to shoot 10 birds. When I say shoot, I do mean uh, inject it down their throats. So, we got enough paste on our cap to do 10 birds, and this great little system I have for mixing the uh, water and the uh, paste together. You take your jar, put a little bit of rice in there, it doesn't have to be too much, maybe about that much rice in there, and uh, 
great system for uh, uh, injecting the uh, medicine into your birds down their throat is uh, use a monoject syringe and make a mark on your syringe right about there because that's how much liquid you're going to use um, to medicate your birds. So this is enough liquid for one bird and only dose one bird at a time. You don't want to fill the syringe all the way up and then just sh shoot it in because uh, the way the monoject syringe works is you run the risk of actually giving your birds too much medication. So if you only do one bird at a time, you don't ever have to worry about giving your bird too much medication. And the great way to do it is draw some water. I have a little container of water here. And I just draw right up to my dosage. There's one dose. And two doses. Three doses, four, and this works pretty well, five, you'll notice I'm pulling right up to the mark, six, seven, doesn't matter what the temperature of the water is, eight, sometimes if you use a little warmer water, it'll tend to be less of a shock, nine, to your bird system. They don't seem to mind warm water as much as they mind the cold, cold water. So I've got the uh, paste on the cap here. I've got 10 doses in the container here. And I've learned from experience that if I add a little bit more water, at the end of my medication, it seems like I've used just the right amount. So just add about a half a dose more. I don't know where that water goes to, but it just seems to disappear. So, I've got a paste on the top of my cap. I've got the rice here. I've got water. Turn the jar over and start shaking. That rice breaks up the paste. Gets the paste mixed in really well with the water. Otherwise, if you don't use, if you don't put rice or grain or something in there to agitate and break up the paste, the paste tends to clump and it'll. Uh, actually smear around on the edge of the glass. You'll see white paste rubbing, rubbing around on the glass. And uh, the rice works great. Great for mixing any other kind of medication that you want to give to your birds. If you have a vitamin that you have to give to them and you have to mix it in with water, toss a little grain, a little rice in there, and that'll get it really mixed in there well. Okay, now I'm ready to dose my birds. I'm going to pull out one dose right here. There you go. Perfect amount of medication to treat one bird for worms. <laughs> okay. Okay, well now we're ready to medicate our birds and uh, got my uh, syringe all set up here and one of the things that I might suggest is if you do have extra syringes you could uh, load up extra doses you know each syringe is ready to dose one bird that'll save you a little time in the lot that way you won't have to draw your medication each time and I've got Helen here and uh, she's got a bird ready for us hi Helen hi tell us a little bit about this bird this is Mark he's a four-year-old cock bird and he is ready to get rid of worms get rid of worms Mark doesn't look very wormy to me, but uh, <laughs> he's gonna, he's gonna, if he does have any worms, they're gonna be gone now, so goodbye worms. Uh, this is the way you hold your syringe, uh, the way I hold the syringe, is just hold it in the palm of your hand like so, and you have your thumb ready there, and that way you can just uh, push the medication into your bird. So, you know, prop Mark's uh, mouth open here. Good old Mark. And I'm gonna slide the syringe right down the old throat here. And there we go. A little bit of bubbles in there. And Mark's toast. And there he is. <laughs>